Thank you. Thank you, John. The way John introduces me makes me feel as if I am uh, a contemporary of Noah. <laughs> Maybe I'm not too far. Um, and what I want to share very briefly is really God's goodness to me through the years that I've known him. When I say I'm not too far from Noah, maybe it's because of the kind of background in which I grew, which was common, of course, in Kenya, which is very different from the Kenya that maybe When I was about 12 years old, I was in primary school, I heard from some boys stories about people, the members of the church where I was in Meru, who seemed to have gone crazy because they would meet and they would, they would talk about their lives, they would uh, confess all kinds of sins which I did not expect or we did not expect from teachers or uh, judge elders, but that's what they were confessing. This was something new in the area. And uh, by nature, I'm bit curious, so I, I, I wondered how I could go and see these people, and it turned out that the following Saturday, there was going to be a meeting uh, of these people who were not only confessing sins and saying all kinds of things, but also saying, God spoke to me and said this or that, and I thought we must be false. How can God speak to a human being? And uh, it used to be that um, on Saturday I would be given by my mother a job in the morning. And when I finished, I was free for the rest of the day. That Saturday, uh, my job was to go to the bush and collect fire. So I collected uh, as much firewood as I could and then went off to a meeting, expecting to, to see people that I thought were crazy or false prophets or whatever. But that's not quite what I found. The first thing which struck me was that this meeting included quite respectable people. In particular, I remember the headmaster, the famous headmaster uh, of a primary school, who was part of the team which was preaching. And that, that caught my attention and helped me to listen to what they were saying. And to my amazement, they were talking about God who loves people so much that he sent his son to die for them. That was new to me because the sort of God I had heard about was one who kept a record of every wrong that he did and he was going to punish you one of these days. But I heard there that this God not only sent his son to save people, but actually to do his best to save them, or rather, let, let me see, let me uh, try and say what that passage, as you know, in John 3, says. Not only that he loves people so much that he gave his only son uh, so that whoever believes 
we have eternal life. But he emphasizes that he did not come to condemn people. I expect that I would, I mean, I was expecting perhaps I would be condemned, but it is, the preacher said from this passage, no, God sent his son, not to condemn the world, but so that through him he might have life. And then someone carried on and said that people could be saved. Confess your sins, repent, or rather to repent, confess your sins, and accept Christ as your savior. And I did that. I did not uh, have many obvious sins which I was to confess, but I knew that I was tempted always to, to tell lies <laughs> and sometimes to get far too, hung, too angry, rather, not hung, angry. Um, so anger and lying were the things that I remember confessing. And I confessed, but then I decided that I did not wish to be identified with these people because I did not want to be scorned by my classmates and others. I would try to be a secret disciple uh, as much as I could. But it did not last because uh, my friends soon recognized that I wasn't quite the same boy as they knew because, for example, I did not participate in uh, teasing girls. So, what an older boy in the class uh, said, well, are you saved? I kept quiet. And then he said, okay, did you go to that meeting on Saturday? Impressed, and I was forced to say yes, I did. And uh, so they said, so something happened to you. And anyway, very briefly, uh, there was a boy in my class. I should say a man because in those days he used to have even when we were in primary school, class one, men who were married and had children. Um, so an older student in my class went and reported to, him, to the headmaster that I had got saved. And the headmaster happened to be saved himself. Uh, and he gave orders that I attend a fellowship meeting, which I did not wish to attend. But since it's the headmaster, what could I do? So I attended. And so in that way, I became part of the revival fellowship. And what a, a wonderful thing to belong to the to that fellowship. I think with it, without it, I would not have lasted. A test came three years later, a big test of my faith kid. Um, if you if you if you are doing your maths, you may know now. Now that we we are in the 1950s, early 50s, and at that time the Mau Mau movement had gathered momentum. It was recruiting people, who young uh, men especially, who are 16 or above in age. They wanted every to take a more, a, an oath of unity because they wanted to uh, unify people against the colonial government. But they required that you, um, you had to, to, to denounce Christ if you had to join the movement. In other words, 
um, they had a more a, a, a north of unity which you are required to take. But that oath required that you denounce Christ. And I decided that I was not going to do that, whatever the cost. And the cost, the cost could be death, could be torture, and so forth. But the, the Lord gave me the strength to say, to decide that if I'm approached to go to a northern ceremony, I would not go. Whatever the, the cost. Then my father said to me, I must take this oath so that um, I am not killed. He himself was part of the movement. Um, I said, no, I will not take the oath. And he said, if you don't take the oath, I am not going to pay your school fees. So I had to choose between carrying on as a Christian and joining the Mama movement. I chose to carry on as a believer, Christ, I, I, I would miss high school. This was happening when I was in high school. And I was really concerned because I really wanted to go forward with my education. What do I do? I prayed and decided, yes, I was not going to take the oath, even if that means I'm not going to carry on with education. <clears throat> and I shared this in our fellowship meeting in my church. And uh, one member said to me, you know, you go to the local authority, it was then called the Africa District Council, you could go to the uh, head of it, he happens to come from my area, and he can employ you during the vacation, and you can raise the money you need. And so the following morning I walked 15 kilometers or so to Mero Town, went to the office, and uh, I didn't explain to the, this big man why I was looking for money, but I just asked him if I could have a, a job during the holidays. And he said, when do you want to start? Today? You can start today if you like. He said, no, I'll start tomorrow. Um, so I started and raised all the money I needed for school fees as well as for my personal needs. And from that time, I worked every vacation, every holiday in high school and um, in college and raised all the money. In other words, from the age of about 17, I became independent financially. Never needed any help from anyone. I saw God work in that wonderful way, um, which encouraged me to carry on. The long story is very long. I have to choose what to say. Uh, you have heard that uh, an academic, or oh, I was, I'm not sure if I am now. Uh, <laughs> This happened, the, the beginning really of the long trip to being an academic and so on, started in my last year at the Lions High School when a missionary teacher, those days all our teachers were missionaries except one or two Americans, gave a talk on the Christian faith and science. 
he seemed to be very uneasy as he gave this talk. He kept looking at a little book, a booklet. And after the class, they asked him if I could borrow the little book because I had not followed all he had said. And he said no. <laughs> then on second thought, he said, well, I, you can write to the publishers of this organization, I mean, uh, the publishers of this book, and I think they will send you a copy. So he gave me the address of the International, sorry, the InterVarsity Fellowship of Christian Unions in the UK. And uh, they sent me the booklet, which talked about, as I've said, the, the relationship between Christian faith and science. And the way this uh, booklet helped with it was basically to say, look at all these great men of science who are Christians, such as Newton, Faraday, and so forth. These were Christians, and they were scientists, leading scientists. But that, looked, that, uh, that was helpful. But what um, led me on was a statement there that scientists were working on, were trying to, to understand the nature of life and its origin. Something to that effect. I was very, very interested in learning the nature of life. And that led me then to pursue science um, as uh, something which I would do in the university. From there then I went to Makerere. At that time we had only one university college for the whole of East Africa. Um, we had students from the whole of East Africa as well as one or two from Central Africa. And the, it was a small college, 800 students. So it was a real privilege to be able to go to Makerere. And um, I should just mention that here I got involved in the Christian Union. And uh, interestingly, last year I got a, a message from Makare saying, can you tell us something about the history of the Christian Union? At one time I was the chairman of the Christian Union. And uh, I just finished recently writing an article on the history. Uh, it's a, just a bit of the history because the Christian Union seems to have started almost as early as Makerere started, which was 1922. From um, Makerere, with a degree in science, and I, at Makerere, of course, since I was interested in life, I did zoology and chemistry. And um, I didn't really I didn't know what I was going to do with that degree, but towards the end it became clear that I could become uh, a researcher. I could become a research scientist, and uh, the Lord opened the way for me to start uh, doing research at uh, a medical research institute in Tanzania. And from there, I got uh, a scholarship to go to London to do a PhD. And then I returned to Makere as a lecturer for a short time before coming to University College in Nairobi. Um, an amazing thing happened when I was in the UK, which is um, the man who sent me the booklet happened to be uh, 
um, really an academic, he was doing student work with intervarsity fellowship. And he took upon himself, I should say the Lord put it in his heart to um, mentor me um, to be an, a Christian academic. But I was not planning to be an academic. I was planning to be a full-time researcher, working on disease, tropical diseases. Um, but he, he prepared me, introduced me to student work. Um, he took a lot of personal interest in me. And it turned out that he himself had intended to be uh, an academic. He had done a PhD in zoology at Cambridge but the Lord has led it to student work. I came back, as I've said, to my career first and to Nairobi, and my career near the 20 years at the University of Nairobi was really a wonderful time. Um, First of all, I had wonderful opportunities to interact with the Christian Union, which is where I knew John Ghana and uh, Mina and other, other brothers here. Just working with them, being, we call it patron or advisor. <laughs> It's a wonderful opportunity, and many of us who went to the Christian Union went on to do wonderful things for the Lord in the professions, in business, even in the church. Um, it was a real real privilege to have been involved in that Christian Union. And it was physically from that Christian Union uh, where the fellowship of Christian unions focus started. Uh, I had the privilege of being involved in the initial uh, work that led to the formation of the Christian Union here and other national movements in the region. Now, when I was in college and in high school, I had thought a little bit about marriage. But those days, those days, young men and young women didn't mix much. much. In some areas in our revival fellowships, if you felt you, you are ready, needed to get married, you told the brethren, they prayed for you, and they told you who you are to marry. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, didn't appeal to me very much. <laughs> I was in a sense a rebellious young man, like, or you are. Um, but when I was finishing college, I, I, didn't, I had no idea what I would do about marriage. Um, I had prayed to the Lord that He would give me one who knew the Lord, first of all, and one who was, who was educated. And that is Humanly speaking, an impossible prayer. Why? Because there were very few educated girls. And among those who are educated, and when I say educated, I mean they had got to what is now from two uh, or from three. <laughs> Among those who are educated, there are 
hardly any who are, who are saved. So it was a very difficult prayer from a human point of view. But um, two months before I finished at Makere, I decided I had a sort of urge what, to go and visit a, a, a Kenyan couple who were in the Rebellion of Fellowship at tea time. So I went, and the, the young couple would be with, and they had a visitor. There was a girl there. And um, this, the, the lady of the house sent up to the kitchen to make tea. And I was, I didn't even notice it. I mean, I didn't see the face properly. I was curious. <laughs> so she went to the kitchen and made tea, and then she disappeared. She did not sit to have tea with um, but she had an effect on me which I had never had before. <laughs> but I, 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 I wasn't really ready for marriage for friendship and marriage, because I wanted to go out, do some work, be established, then I could get married. So, I decided to forget her. But um, I, when I think of it, I think of, I remember Zechariah. Um, God answering his prayer and he not believing it. I tried to get away from her, um, but the Lord did not allow me to get away because what happened was as soon as I finished college, I was going to start a research project which covered the whole of East Africa, traveling between, I mean, traveling uh, different areas where preservation. And I asked um, a student from Nyeri if he knew where I could go and stay when I was doing my research in Nyeri. And um, you know where he arranged? He arranged for me to stay in the home of this girl. <laughs> so I, I stayed a couple of days with her and I knew I could not get away from her. <laughs> so we, we became friends. I, she was at Makere and I, in Mons at that time. We, we corresponded. Um, I proposed and she agreed. I proposed by correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> we got married and um, I can tell you for sure that she was just the perfect partner for me. Absolutely, the perfect partner, she educated and academic, and one with whom we are on the same wavelength spiritually. And um, that enabled me to, to do things which I could not do on my own. For example, um, having students graduates to my home, uh, that's not something I could do. And um, she was very good at it. She was a very good cook. 
And then um, some years later, when we had been married about 34, exactly 34 years, she suddenly died. And that's the worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, I was left really bereft. I did not know how to run the house, apart from the emotional, uh, emotional trauma. There was a, just a practical thing about running a home. We had five children. What do I do? Some of them were grown and gone. Um, But the Lord saw me through that uh, that time. I was uh, 65, going to 66. What do I do? Can I manage the home? There's absolutely no way I could do it. And by the way, I can, I mean, from that experience, I gained more respect for women than I ever had. Um, I don't believe that, that men here really know what gift a good wife is from the Lord. It's, it's a tremendous gift. Now I'm 66, I mean 65 going on to 65. Where do I get a wife? Again, I couldn't run. A home, I need a wife. I didn't want to have a kid as a wife. Where do I get a wife? It was a, a big issue, of which of course I prayed a lot about. And then the Lord provided someone who was mature, well educated, saved, just what I need. Sadly, um, 11 years or so, she also died, and I was left uh, alone again. <laughs> so I'm now in that situation, and the Lord is still with me. Let me say something about academic work before I sit down. Um, one great thing about being an academic is that the progress you make depends on your work, not on bribing other people. At least in my time, that's how it was. I don't know now if it is still the same, but that's how it was. Um, everything depended on you. I had learned when I was younger that one major way in which you testify, one main way in which you show that you are Christian is the quality of your work. In the case of an academic, your teaching and your research both go together. Um, when I joined, I was prepared to go out to I mean, to get to whatever stage the Lord allowed me to go. But I went through all the stages, uh, being a, a full professor, to being uh, head of the department and um, head of the faculty of science. And I stayed, I decided I was trying to stay, to remain there. I was not going to look for an administrative job, which is what a VC or deputy VC uh, do, administration. Why? Because the heart of the university is not in the VC's office. It is where the teaching and research happens. And the Lord helped me to, to remain there. And um, there's one other thing I would just 
like to mention because it was a, a great surprise to me. One day, uh, when I was relatively young, I was a senior lecturer, I attended a meeting of what was called a convocation. I don't think it exists now. Um, and it consisted of the academic staff and former students. And they were represented on the governing council um, by two people. One day, uh, I wasn't very busy in the afternoon, and I thought I would attend the a meeting of the convocation. When I got in, I found they were, they, were, they were voting for these two representatives to the University Council. They had already found one, they had agreed on one. As, as I got there, before I sat, even before I sat properly, someone proposed my name uh, for this position. I was not at all prepared for it. I tried to pray. Oh, sorry, I should say it before I started praying. I said, no, I did not want to stand for election. Then somebody else seconded the proposal that I be a candidate, and I knew it was getting serious, so I started praying. But before I finished my prayer, the chairman of the meeting closed the nominations and I was elected. <laughs> and I served on, I was re-elected every three years until I found I, I couldn't do any more. I was there for about 13 years. I felt that was enough. These are some of the things that the Lord has done for me, some of the things he has taught me. Um, and what can I say but that I really praise him for the way he led me, even when I didn't know it, where, where I was going, and the wonderful way in which he answered prayer. I want to emphasize that God is the Lord who answers prayer. Some of you wanted to know about challenges in life. It's not a big one. And you can see he is continuing to love the Lord. And uh, you have a small problem is making you backslide. <laughs> I felt I, I should say something um, because I told you how I was elected as a member of the University Council. And my purpose was not to tell you that I was a member of the University Council, but why? That's because I think it's important. When I got into that room and someone proposed my name and I, I said no, someone else shouted, no, Dr. Kinoti, because the Vice Chancellor needs to know the truth. Because the Vice Chancellor, the first Vice Chancellor of the University of Nairobi, was regarded as a very arrogant person who did not have time for staff, not to say students. I don't think students got anywhere near his office. Um, so, that is why I was elected. And I want to emphasize this because those of you who are at the University of Nairobi will know what kind of academics we had. Were they Christians? No. I think if you knew anything about them, they were very hostile to yeah. the Christian faith. But for someone to say, we want him because he's a Christian, 
so that the vice chancellor can hear the truth was amazing to me because these, were, these people were from all the campuses of the, the University of Nairobi at that time. How did they know that I was a Christian? How did they, did they know that the vice, what I would say in council was the, the truth when other people may not want to say anything because they are afraid of the vice chancellor. So I think that our testimony known by the environment in which you work is extremely important. That is why I told you that story. Thank you.